The universe has been expanding for 13.8 billion years, but the beginning of that expansion is still shrouded in mystery. In this series, we explore competing models for what happened at or even before the Big Bang. But whatever the cause was for the universe, one can still ask, what caused that? And what caused that? And what caused that? Is there a way out of this problem? Is it possible that the universe has no first cause? Could the universe create itself? The very notion may seem outrageous, but some scientists have argued that Einstein's theory of general relativity may allow the universe to bootstrap itself into existence. One of these scientists is Princeton University's Professor Richard Gott. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and I got interested in astronomy when I was eight years old. And I was very uh, excited about the Big Bang um, even at that time, before it had been um, proven by Penzias and Wilson discovering the cosmic microwave background. And interestingly, I got to work with them when I was a graduate student and, and got to run the telescope that, that discovered the microwave background all night. And I, I would occasionally turn it over and look at the moon. I'd see the thermal radiation from the moon. Einstein's theory of general relativity, with its curving of space-time, leads to a radical revision of how we understand the passage of time. Time does not have a uniform flow like Newton thought. It's variable and depends on how fast you're moving, depends on how deep a gravitational well you're living in. Clocks on the Earth tick slower than clocks at high altitude. And so this is important in your GPS uh, satellites. Uh, they put this general relativity effect in. If you didn't put that in, your, your GPS would tell you the wrong location, literally. I am here, but you consider your location as here. So we recognize that the notion of here is subjective. What relativity tells us is that the notion of now is also subjective. The past doesn't disappear when you leave it just like your location doesn't disappear when you leave it. This is because the speed of light is the same for all observers. Speed is simply distance over time, and if the speed of light is absolute, then distance and time must be relative. This leads us to a new view of space and time known as the block universe. Time is like a fourth dimension. Um, what about now? Two observers traveling on rocket ships at different speeds in special relativity have different ideas of simultaneity. So I say these events are simultaneous, the rocket guy has these events are simultaneous. It's like you have a loaf of bread, I slice it like American bread, okay? That's one instant, that's another instant, that's another instant, okay? The moving astronaut, he slices it on a slant, like French bread, okay? And he's, he, 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 so those events are simultaneous. Those events are simultaneous. He and I disagree on which event occurred first of distant events and so forth. The loaf is the same. We can both agree on the loaf. This idea of the block universe has been very productive. It's given us equals mc squared. It's given us all of the results of special relativity. The faster an object travels, the slower its clock will tick travel at the speed of light, and time stands still. If you could travel faster than light, then you move backwards in time. It was a young lady called Bright, who traveled far faster than light. She left one day in a relative way and returned home the previous night. <laughs> so there's one trouble with that. Einstein showed you in special relativity that you couldn't go build a rocket that would go faster than the speed of light. So. In 1915, though, he invented the theory of general relativity, curved space-time. So now, there's a loophole. You can, you can beat a light beam by taking a shortcut, going through a wormhole, or going around a cosmic string. In the 1930s, when many academics fled Europe due to growing anti-Semitism, 
both Einstein and mathematician Kurt Gödel found themselves at Princeton. The two of them would go for long walks, presumably discussing relativity, as Kurt Gödel, in one of his few contributions to physics, found solutions to Einstein's equations that could allow time travel into the past. These have become known as closed time-like curves. Many decades later, Richard Gott, carrying on this Princeton tradition, has found other ways to travel into the past. These are closed time-like curves. It's time travel to the past. These are general relativity solutions that are sufficiently twisted that they allow the time traveler to circle back and visit an event in his own past. So um, this started out when I um, uh, found an exact solution to Einstein's field equations for a cosmic string. Cosmic string is a, is a thin piece of vacuum energy left over from the Big Bang. It has a negative pressure along the direction of the string and a positive energy density. And this is like when the vacuum decays, uh, it's like snow melting and you're left with a few snowmen standing. And we're looking for these. We haven't found them yet, but they're predicted in many theories. When the strings move fast enough, but still slower than the speed of light, uh, but close to the speed of light, you could circle them and come back to an event in your own past. So this was a time travel solution. Um, like a number of time travel solutions in general relativity, um, there was originally Kurt Gödel found a rotating universe that had closed time-like curves that, like this in it. And um, uh, Kip Thorne and his collaborators um, uh, Morris and Yurtsever uh, found uh, time travel solutions with a wormhole. It's just flat space time. Um, time is going this way. Space is going this way. And, and here's my world line. I'm going straight up here toward the future. I'm just staying home, okay? But this space-time could be twisted around like this so that, it, so that my world line always is going toward the future, toward the future, toward the future, and yet circles back and visits uh, the past. This is just like what happened when Magellan's crew went west, west, west around the world and found itself back in Europe. So if you're a time traveler like this, you're always going toward the future. But like a loop-the-loop -loop on the roller coaster, you're finding yourself looping back into the past because space-time is curved. So a closed time-like curve can allow time travel to the past. But in order to understand how this relates to the universe creating itself, one needs to understand the history of the early universe. According to most cosmologists, the universe underwent an exponentially fast expansion known as inflation. This was first described by Alan Guth, who we interviewed in episode four of this series. The overall effect was gravitationally repulsive, and this explained like how the universe started expansion, and also explained how the, um, the microwave background radiation was so uniform, because there's a little extra time in there for different regions to get in causal contact. Um, but Guth wanted the, um, this vacuum state to decay into normal particles so we'd have a normal expanding Big Bang model. And so he, he wanted this to decay all at once so it would be uniform. And that's like um, putting on um, uh, water on the stove and having it just turn into steam all at once. But he realized that there was a problem with that and that was that when you actually would do that it would form bubbles of steam just like when you boil water. I wrote a paper in 1982 saying the answer to this problem was that we lived in one of the bubbles. We lived in a bubble universe. Our universe was one of these bubbles and from inside the bubble uh, everything looked uniform. And so that solved Goose's um, problem. Beyond our universe we expect to find other bubble universes and within a very short time after my paper appeared, paper by Linde and Albrecht and Steinhardt appeared that had a detailed particle physics scenario to produce this and this uh, was called new inflation and it solved the uh, problems in, in inflation. So this was a um, geometrical picture of having a, a, a multiverse. So we believe in inflation because uh, it explains so beautifully the fluctuations that we see in the cosmic microwave background. Richard Gott is a world expert on relativity. 
To understand the beginning, he needed to team up with someone with a similar level of expertise in quantum mechanics. I'm sitting in my office one day and I get a letter from a Chinese student, Li Jingli, and he wants to come to Princeton as a, for graduate school. And he's included a paper that he's written. And this is a paper, uh, Stephen Hawking had written that uh, there would, in a wormhole, there would be some sort of um, 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 effect where the fields would, would, would build up and it would blow, blow up. Li Jing Li had invented uh, the idea of putting a reflecting ball in between the two wormholes that would deflect these waves and, and not let them build up like this. It was a, it was a way to counter Hawking's objection to the uh, wormhole of um, uh, time machine of Kip Thorne. I'd already read this paper. It was in the Physical Review. I really liked it. I thought this was a fantastic paper. And I said, wow, this is a student who would like to come. So, so I got him to come to Princeton, got him to come to Princeton, and when he arrived, uh, we, we worked on this time travel um, solution. So, um, I'm the general relativity guy, and I knew he knew how to do all this fancy quantum mechanics stuff. What people do, we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, but what we do is we, we specify a geometry of curved space-time, what this model is going to look like. And then we apply quantum mechanics in curved space-time. This is called the semi-classical approach. So we just apply this complicated quantum mechanics to figure out what the quantum vacuum state is that would go with this curved space-time. The amazing thing about Stephen Hawking is that he could do both the general relativity part and invent the quantum mechanics. He was the first to do this or apply quantum mechanics and curved space-time to do. So, so he could do both parts here together. With the general relativity and quantum mechanics in place, Gott and Lee were ready to present their model of the early universe. This? <laughs> is, um, looks like something Dr. Seuss would invent. Um, this is um, inflation, and um, Linde said that inflating universes could give birth to other inflating universes by quantum fluctuations. This was like branches coming off a tree. What Li Jing Li and I proposed was that the universe could give birth to a a branch like this that circled back in time, like these time loops, and gave birth to itself. Because when you have this model, you say, well, okay, I got the branches, but where did the trunk come from? Well, a branch could branch off, it expands, and then becomes the trunk. This is like, it expands by a factor of 535, so you can think of this as a one-inch branch branching off, growing up into a 535. 35 inch trunk uh, that the branch comes off of. So there's, this, so there's this time loop at the beginning and this universe gives birth to itself. The great thing about inflation is that a little tiny inflating piece grows up to be an enormous inflating piece, each little bit of which is exactly like the little bit that it started with. So what if one of those little bits was actually the bit that it started with. Then it could give birth to itself. Something funny had to happen at the beginning of the universe, and uh, time travel and solutions in general relativity seem supremely suited for the purpose. This space-time here, where it's a cylinder, um, I've called this uh, Groundhog Day space-time because it's a flat space-time, but it just you just keep repeating the same day, like Bill Murray did in that movie. You can have what's called a gin particle. This is one that has a circular world line, and that person was never born. You, you have a place where your world line starts, that's when you're born, where it ends, that's where you die. But this one just goes around in a, in a circle. If the universe is in a time loop, why doesn't it go around forever? How does it get out? Well, this is a, this is a very good question. Um, the, the Groundhog Day universe, that's flat space-time. And it just curls around the cylinder. Nothing interesting happens. It doesn't get out of the circle, okay? But 
we're talking about an inflating universe. This is called the sitter space. And it's curved. So it does break out. This is a diagram of the sitter space. It's a map of the sitter space. And the sitter space is, is, is a spherical universe, little tiny thing that you saw before with the, with the bubble universes. And it just gets bigger and bigger. So this is, the, this is the south pole of the sphere. This is the north pole. And as you go up here, this just makes an expanding, um, gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is the infinite future here. The only thing that's real in here is this region that's colored in, because I'm taping this to this and everything else is gone. Um, but this opens out, you see, into a big, inflate, infinitely large inflating region here in the far future. And then you can form your bubble universes there. This is a picture where you end up um, with a time machine at the beginning of the universe that quits. And then we have no time travel after that. To turn ideas from theoretically plausible to accepted fact, they must be empirically tested. So how can this be done for the Gotham Lee model? Okay, let me give you a humorous answer first. Okay. Um, when they were about to select the new pope, I wondered, well, who might they select? Like everybody was wondering. And so I thought to myself, well, you know, um, South America is an important area for the Catholic Church. It's been growing greatly. And so they've gone outside Italy before. I think they're going to go with a South American pope. And if it was a South American pope, well, uh, poverty is a big issue in the Catholic Church in South America. And so the pope would pick a name that would be um, uh, relevant to that, um, St. Francis, you know. So I said to my wife, I think I'll tweet this. The next pope, I think, is going to be a South American, and he's going to name himself Pope Francis, okay? And she said, she always gives me good advice. She said, oh, don't do that. You'll make people mad. You're not, a, you're not you know, empowered to say that. Why am I discussing this? Well, there were a couple of guys, I think, I think they were from MIT, as I recall. They decided to, to experimentally test time travel by looking for time travelers among us, okay? So they looked for a couple of words, a couple of phrases on the internet that couldn't possibly have been known ahead of time. Imagine, if you will, that I'd made that tweet. And, oh, here's somebody who said Pope Francis. Oh my God, it's someone who works on time travel. <laughs> oh my Lord. <laughs> the serious answer is, um, one of the things about, um, inflation is that it forgets its initial condition. It expands by so much. It, it doesn't forget its initial conditions. So it's hard to tell which, which one of these different, different models would, would have been correct. Um, and, and, and that's a difficulty. But you can have what I would call an indirect answer. Um, um, many people today believe that we live in a multiverse with like the many bubble universes. Um, why do they believe that? Well, because we believe in inflation, because it believes it, it, it does things we can test, like the, the um, cosmic microwave background, the fact that we're seeing inflation occurring today. Um, inflation is testable. And these early universe models will be tested if we get the string theory to finally produce what we call the theory of everything that we're looking for. The important thing about that theory is that it has these extra tiny dimensions that are curled up and tiny. Well, inflation tells us that the big spatial dimensions that we see today, the three big, large spatial dimensions, used to, they were tiny. Here, all the spatial dimensions are curled up and tiny in the early universe. And ours just goes one step further. There's a curled up dimension of time here. So this seems to fit in very well with super string, what super string theory might produce. And I think ultimately, um, when we get a theory of quantum gravity, there'll be other testable predictions it makes. And then you'll look at the solutions of those equations 
in the early universe, and you'll see if you get a model like this. Stephen Hawking has put forward the chronology protection conjecture, implying that time travel to the past is simply disallowed by the laws of physics. Otherwise, what would prevent you from going back in time and killing one of your grandparents? One, one wag once said, um, you know, you know why the Titanic sank? It was because of the extra weight of all the time traveler, you know, um, people on board, you know. Um, or another way to say that is if you went back and tried to warn the captain of the Titanic uh, iceberg, you know, he'd ignore you like he ignored all the other iceberg warnings because uh, we know the ship sank. It's one four-dimensional sculpture. It does not change. Okay, so if you went to the past and did something, you, 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 you're already part of history. You're, you're already on the roll call of the people who are on the Titanic, so to speak. The other solution is the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics. It's where you have many parallel worlds that are like trains in a train track junction, and there's a world where World War II never happened, and there's a world where people never landed on the moon. And every time you make a decision or you make a measurement, a new world branches off. So if the time traveler went to the past, saw his grandmother, killed her, He's killed a grandmother in another parallel universe. And the parallel, the universe where she was born and you lived on, to, she gave birth to you, to your mother and to you, that, that parallel past still exists. So there was no paradox. So the grandfather paradox has, has two separate solutions. We, we don't know which is correct because we don't know whether the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics is correct, but you do not have to rely on that. He's assuming that some law of physics we'll discover in the future will prevent them, okay? We don't know of anything that'll prevent them so far. In the mid-1960s, Hawking wrote a very important paper. It said, let me assume two things. Let me assume that there are no closed time-like curves and let me assume that gravity is always attractive. Now let me look at the expansion of the universe that we observe, and let me trace that back in time. I can prove then that there's a singularity at the beginning of everything. But you know what? By assuming those two things, he missed discovering inflation, because inflation is gravitationally repulsive. We observe dark energy doing this in the universe today. Hawking didn't know that. So that violated the conditions of his thing. We have to remember that it is a conjecture, and the conjectures don't always ha have to be right. Um, one of the things Hawking says in, on television, and he knows this is a joke, well, where are all the time travelers like at the Kennedy assassination, you know? The idea there is that, well, if you wait long enough, technology will advance enough for them to come back to the present epoch. Well, well uh, Hawking knows perfectly well that the time, kind of time machines that Kip Thorne and I are proposing, there's a time loop that's created up there in the future, where you, you're moving strings or you're moving wormhole mouths up in the year 3000, and the, the, there's a Cauchy horizon where the time travel starts, okay? And before that, there wasn't any time travel. So if you create a time loop, let's say in the year 3000, you may use it to go from 3002 back to 3001, but you can't use it to come back here. The laws of physics seem to be time reversible at a fundamental level. And yet we see a definite arrow of time. We remember the past, but we never remember the future. And we would easily notice if a film of a clock face was running backwards, but it's not so easy with a film of a pendulum. The laws of physics seem to be like the pendulum, whereas our experience is more like the clock face with the definite arrow of time. So an ideal feature of a cosmological model would be to explain how this arrow of time emerges. An unexpected property that we found about our model, we didn't build it into it at all, is that it gives you a natural arrow of time. Here's a close-up picture of space-time. This time goes this way. Here's a, here's a particle, an electron. Let's say I shake it here. Electromagnetic waves go out toward the future. I mean, they would get to Alpha Centauri, who's four light years away. They get to it four years later. And the people on Alpha Centauri would see this signal that we'd sent them. We observe this. 
We do not observe this. This is called an advanced wave. And when we shake a charge, we do not observe electromagnetic radiation going off to the past. That would look to us like every time you shook a charge, before that, you saw electromagnetic waves coming toward it just at the right time, and then it would, then it would uh, do this. Um, we know that electromagnetism is a theory that is time symmetric. General relativity is a theory that is time symmetric. So why do we only see this solution and not this solution, okay? Well, in our model, there's a very easy and interesting answer to this. Um, if I make, send a photon out here toward the future, it just, it just goes out on toward the future. Harmless, okay, no trouble. But if it goes toward the past, it goes down in here, goes down in here, circles this time loop. Notice that the universe is contracting the, the way it's seen. This causes it to blue shift. This causes it to become more and more energetic and more and more energetic. It circles this an infinite number of times and it creates an infinite energy density. It blows the thing up, okay? That's not the geometry you started with. That would change the curvature of, that would be a different curvature of space-time than, than you had. So that would be like killing your grandmother. That's, a, that's what would, would, would happen here. That's not a self-consistent solution of this geometry. Notice what happened if you go the other way around, though. Let's say I had a photon that was going around this way, or a graviton that was going around this way. Um, it would go around here, and every time it circles, the universe is expanded by a factor of 535. It's been redshifted by a factor, stretched by a factor of 535. It's lost energy by a factor of 535. Every time it goes around, it loses another factor of 535 in energy. It could circle an infinite number of times and leave you with a convergent answer. 1 plus 1 over 500 plus 1 over 500 squared, plus 1 over 500 cubed. That sums up to a finite number. In here, in the time loop region, the temperature is cold. It's absolute zero in here. There's no th you don't see any thermal radiation. If you lived here, if, if you would put a detector in here, you, you, you would see it's absolutely cold. This is a low entropy state. And here, once you cross this boundary, you start to see the fact that you have event horizons. You can't see those other, you know, funnels and those other universes. And, and so you, you merge out here and it heats up and you see the Hawking radiation due to the event horizons that you're seeing. So by the time you get up here, you're seeing a hot um, um, uh, that's uh, heat that's um, thermal radiation consistent with this uh, de Sitter space that you, you would expect. Okay, so it's going from cold initial conditions to hot initial conditions, um, and that's an increase in entropy. So this time loop is a low entropy loop because of its geometry, and, and that's giving the universe low entropy initial conditions. This is what you need to have the entropy arrow of time always run downhill from there. Once you start out with it, it just rolls downhill. So we get an entropy arrow of time automatically, and we get a, a causal arrow of time that, that you shake something here and then later this effect occurs, this normal causality we're getting with these retarded potentials. Um, we get these two things for free from this model. Recently, physicist Aaron Wall has claimed that thermodynamics might spell trouble for closed time-like curves. This is a picture diagram from, from him. And this is the wormhole that's being illustrated here. You got a wormhole mouth over here, and you got another wormhole mouth over here, and they're not synchronized. So this line is a closed time-like curve where the guy comes along here, and then disappears into this wormhole mouth and immediately appears back here. So this is a gin particle. This is one that has a closed time-like curve. What he noticed was that um, um, th this time traveler here is not going to see a light signal that's coming along like this. He's sort of trapped 
in the past and can't never this light signal never going to get to him so there's a there's a um, horizon here there's a Cauchy horizon here that that but but to him it's an event horizon seen from the inside the, this traps the region of time like curves um, he can't he can't see anything beyond this over here. Just like you can't see events that are occurring inside a black hole. The, the regular time traveler, what they would do would be they come over across here, they come into this mouth, they come out of this mouth, they'd say hello to themselves and they go on here to the future. So that's not true for them, but it is true for somebody that's trapped in one of these closed time-like curves. Now, event horizons, have a certain entropy associated with it, a certain amount of disorder that's, that's proportional to the area of the event horizon. So what he noticed was this area of this event horizon is shrinking. And that looks like a decrease of entropy, and that would violate the second law of thermodynamics. This is his point. Now the interesting answer to this is, as far as our model is concerned, let me go back to this picture right here. Here is the person on the closed timelight curve here. Here is this event horizon this person can never see past. Okay, it includes the region of closed timelight curves here. And so, now that looks like it's contracting, doesn't it? So it looks like Mr. Wall is right. But this is a curved space time. You gotta remember that the scale is, de is decreasing as we're, it's being shown at smaller scale here. So the truth is, in this, in this De Sitter space, this is not decreasing in area at all. It's like a cylinder instead of a cone. In fact, if this person were living in regular De Sitter space that wasn't multiply connected, his world line would continue on up here, on up here to infinity, and this would be the event horizon that he would have, and that's a fixed constant radius in De Sitter space. So, Mr. Wall's argument, interestingly, does not apply to ours. He would say, ours doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics. I've said for many years, and it's in this uh, book, um, The uh, Welcome to the Universe, that I did with Neil Tyson and uh, Michael Strauss, um, uh, I've said uh, about gin particles, well, um, it's more probable for you to find like an electron that's a gin than you find something complicated like you know, Leonard Nimoy playing Spock as a gin. And those, those happen improbably, which of course with statistical mechanics you can have a violation of the second law, rarely. In modern physics, empty space can still have energy. This leads to different states of the vacuum. A Minkowski vacuum is associated with flat space-time, a Rindler vacuum with accelerated motion. William Hiscock has argued that the vacuum state implied in closed time-like curves is unstable and therefore rules out the Gott and Lee model. Um, th let's go back to Groundhog Day. Imagine. This is Minkowski space, it's flat space-time, and that has a vacuum called the Minkowski vacuum and it's uh, zero energy density and zero pressure as perfectly well behaved, okay? Now, now, if you wrap this up to make the Groundhog Day, you get what we call a wrapped, or what I would call a wrapped Minkowski vacuum. It's the same as a Minkowski vacuum here, but everything you do here, there's an image of it up here, and there's multiple images of this, so you can, you can calculate the effects of this. And, and you find out that when you wrap this like this, you get, you get an extra vacuum, which is um, like, um, it has a positive energy density and a positive pressure, okay? It's small, so you, you can ignore it. But the, um, uh, in the case where you have a closed time-like curves, uh, if you look with a microscope at where the uh, Cauchy horizon is occurring, where the, where the cl closed time-like curves end and the, the, the region without closed time-like curves begins, um, um, you can see that generically this looks like a little piece of what we call Misner space. And this is a space that looks like 
the Groundhog Day, only instead of being a cylinder, it looks more like a megaphone. It gets narrow as you go over here. And so you can wrap yourself around this and around this and around this, and you go out to the short end and boom, you're out. You're into a region of non-time, closed time-like curves. And that's where the Cauchy horizon occurs. So as this gets narrower, this effect of, um, of, of having this extra, uh, it looks like therm it's, it's like thermal radiation, um, it, it, it gets bigger and bigger and it blows up when, you, when, you're, when you're leaving the space. So um, uh, Hiscock had been one of the people that, uh, that had calculated this originally, and it was one of the reasons people thought that, that crossing that uh, Cauchy horizon, the quantum vacuum state, might blow up. Okay. So this was one of the problems that we were, that we were addressing. So, so Li Jing Li came in to me one day and he says, I've found the answer. Okay. He said, um, the, the, Minka the, the Minkowski vacuum is the wrong one to use. It's really a Rindler vacuum, an accelerated vacuum that's, that's, that's wrapped around this megaphone. The Rindler vacuum has a negative energy density and a negative pressure intrinsically. And when you wrap it, you get the positive energy density and the positive pressure, the two cancel out, and you give you zero. So it's flat space time, what you want. That's the geometry you started with. And as it goes over here, both effects get bigger and bigger, but they cancel out exactly. Meanwhile, a uh, Hawking student, uh, Michael J. Cassidy, uh, had figured out the same thing from using a Euclidean analogy. This, if you change one of the, we, space time has, has three dimensions of space and one to time. If you multiply the time by the imaginary number i, Stephen Hawking has talked about this, you can change time into a Euclidean dimension. And uh, so this is Euclid four dimensions of space, no time. You can work your quantum mechanics in this four-dimensional Euclidean space and gives the same, must give the same results in terms of calculating the energy density as you would get if you did it in the regular space-time. Here's what Cassidy discovered. He discovered that this, this Misner space, like the megaphone with the closed time-like curves, was just flat Euclidean four-dimensional space-time with polar coordinates for two of the directions, so like a longitude. So one of your coordinates was a longitude that went around in a circle, and if, if and you say, well, there's longitude, and there's, there's the distance out from the center. If you made that coordinate your time, multiplied it by the imaginary number i, then, then what would happen would be that you would get um, Misner space here with the closed time-like curves. And since this Euclidean space was the analog of regular space-time with zero energy density, the Misner space must have zero energy density too. So, Mr. Cassidy understood that Misner space must have a vacuum state that had zero energy density. He just didn't know what it was, but he knew it must exist. And Li Jing Li, had already found the correct vacuum state. It was a wrapped Rindler vacuum that gave you zero energy density. Um, so uh, Cassidy's paper came out first, and he got it, and Hawking agreed that, that the, the, this must be true. Um, now, now um, uh, one of Hiscock's criticisms, he's, he's my brother, you know, because we both discovered the, uh, the um, exact metric for around a cosmic string. Um, this, he, he complained that when he did not just a simple scalar field, which um, Li Jing Li had done, but uh, more complicated fields like a self-interacting field or a massive scalar field, that he found that it blew up. And the reason he, f the reason he found it blew up was he was still using, he, when he renormalized it, he was, he was subtracting off a, a Minkowski vacuum, and that was incorrect. When you plugged into um, the correct way of transporting it to uh, Hiscock's results, uh, all the terms canceled out beautifully and it gave zero. So the, the correct self-consistent vacuum 
for Misner space is the wrapped Rindler vacuum and it does not blow up at the Cauchy rise and it does not prevent you from crossing through there and entering the time machine or leaving the time machine. Um, and that's true of our model uh, of the early universe as well. Another criticism of the model is that it requires delicate fine tuning as the time loop would have to have a very specific length to make it work. It's sort of like asking the question, well, why, if, if you go to the North Pole and look at the longitude, why does the longitude always add up to 360 degrees? Well, if you perturbed it slightly, the, gee, the Earth has lots of perturbations. There's mountain ranges, things like that. It's easy to perturb the Earth, but the longitude's always uh, 360 degrees. So the, this, this time loop would be of that length. In two of our recent films, we tackled the bizarre idea that in a multiverse, random fluctuations of conscious brains would outnumber normal observers. If this is the case, then the multiverse would be an untenable proposal. Alan Guth and Thomas Hertog gave several reasons why this idea is flawed. Richard Gott has another. We see dark energy in the universe today with a positive energy density and a negative pressure. This is going to keep doubling and doubling in size. Uh, it will approximate the sitter space, which we've been talking about. That's the same as the inflationary beginning of the universe, only this is going in sort of slow motion. If you look at that long enough, and we're talking about 10 to the 10 to the 70 years, you will see something strange. A Boltzmann brain will appear. It's like monkeys typing typewriter, you know? Eventually you get Shakespeare's play. It expands forever. And so if it goes on forever, there should be an infinite number of these Boltzmann brains in the future of our little patch of the universe. If most of the intelligent observers in the universe are Boltzmann brains, why am I not one of them? The Boltzmann brains are always um, disappearing, you know? They're just a fluke, you know? And so, um, you know, I, I know that I'm not a Boltzmann brain because um, if you ask, if you're having a conversation with a Boltzmann brain and it answers 10 questions correctly, we're giving it the Turing test to see whether it's an intelligent observer. So I'm asking it questions. I'm seeing if it's behaving like a human. And so it answers 10 questions correctly. That's highly unlikely. They disappear like that, okay? They appear and they disappear. Like they're, they're noise on your, on your TV screen. Let me count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, Boltzmann brain can't do that. If you see one that can count up to five, it's quite, of all the ones that can count up to five, greatly outnumber the ones that can count up to six. You're seeing photons from them. It's highly likely when you see the Boltzmann brain, it waves and says hello, uh, that you're just seeing photons. There's no Boltzmann brains there. You're just seeing photons that look like a Boltzmann brain. These are dredged out of the vacuum by you as the observer, okay? Um, and how do you know this? Well, because if passing, here's you, you're passing through the same event as another rocket ship that's going at high speed with respect to you. He has a different set of event horizons than you do, and he sees different hawking photons than you do. He dredges different hawking photons out of that same Gibbons and Hawking vacuum. So you're likely to see a Boltzmann brain that's at rest with respect to you. One going at high speed would be even more improbable because it would have more mass energy associated with it. So if you say, I see a Boltzmann brain, the rocket ship passing right by you says, I don't see anything. They're not real. Those Boltzmann brains aren't real. What's real is the photons that you actually detect. You could see one, but you're unlikely to be one. So they don't bother me. And there have been other people who have also put forward solutions like you're killed when the bubble collides with you before you can see a brain, so, and you should only concentrate on what you can see. And I had a conversation with Paul Davies, who's one of the pioneers of calculating the, the, uh, the uh, uh, vacuum state for the sitter space. Um, uh, I had a conversation with him. He says, I exactly agree with you. The only photons are real are the ones that you've detected. Quantum entanglement is the strange phenomenon that allows pairs of particles to interact instantly as if they are one system. 
The problem is that there seems to be no limit to the distance at which this can be achieved. How this is squared with relativity's restriction on faster than light travel is not clear. But a new way to understand entanglement may make time travel solutions more viable. Recently, um, uh, Maldacena and Susskind have written a very interesting paper where they say that quantum entangled particles are, 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 seem to be maybe connected with a wormhole. Now these are not ones with closed time-like curves in them that they're talking about, but it sort of opens the door to think about easier ways to make wormholes into time machines. Some people have complained that the Hawking radiation, there's a particle that's emitted and there's one that falls into the horizon and that the astronaut going in might be burnt up by the Hawking photons on the inside of the horizon, a so-called firewall, and they showed that this, this entanglement business meant that that vacuum didn't blow up and, and you, you could get inside the black hole. So it's a very interesting paper, and I think it, it, it makes it a little easier to realize some of these time machines. One of the most important concepts in quantum physics is the uncertainty principle which states that there's a fundamental limit as to how accurately we can specify certain quantities in physics. A theory of the early universe will likely need to unify these quantum concepts with relativity. But Richard Gott claims that closed timelight curves would be an inevitable result of combining the two theories. So why does he suggest this? The measurements of time and space become uncertain the time interval between two events becomes uncertain and the spatial separation between two events becomes uncertain by the uncertainty principle. So um, closed time-like curves would naturally seem to occur. This is called space-time foam and it's multiply connected like we want, multiply connected with all sorts of bridges going different places in time and different places in space. It's always pictured as a as a sponge. You know, this is this is how space-time looks at that microscopic scale, so that's why I said that. Another model that takes advantage of quantum uncertainty is Vilenkin's tunneling from nothing, where space and time tunnel into existence from a state of no space and time. This tiny patch of space-time may have its negative gravitational energy balance its positive mass energy, and so could exist forever, inflating into the universe that we see today. Tunneling, quantum tunneling, by definition, has two ends. There's a there has to be a classical solution here over on the other side. If you're just coming from a mountain here, you get a singularity. That's what we're trying to avoid. We think that in quantum gravity, you don't get singularities. Quantum effects always smooth out a singularity. So if you, if you want no singularity, you've got to have a classical solution on the other side. So he really needs that uh, point-like universe on the other side. Li Jing Li and I were saying the universe isn't made out of nothing, it's made out of something, a little tiny piece of itself, and you can do this with a, with a closed uh, time-like loop with a little time machine at the beginning. So um, this is Vilenkin's model. Uh, Stephen Hawking has a model that looks exactly like this, and uh, same thing going on, but, but Hawking commented that the south pole of this, that point at the beginning, is not really any different from the other points. So you've just got a sort of boundary there. And the universe is starting off with a boundary here. Space-time ends here, and there's this little Euclidean section that's on the, that's on the bottom. These are both sculptures, <laughs> four-dimensional sculptures, that are just sitting there, okay? But they have causal things going on in them, microscopically, if you look at it, you can see world lines of photons intersecting things, shaking charges, things like this. And so, um, locally, this model has a boundary at the bottom, um, and our model has a periodic boundary condition at the bottom. Our model has, has um, the property that uh, every event has events that are preceding it, okay? Mr. Diaz, who, who um, compared these two models, said they were quite complementary. And uh, he had analyzed the stability of our model, 
Our model is stable because if you sent a gravity wave around here, it would just uh, keep um, losing energy as it went around. It would make a finite perturbation. It wouldn't, wouldn't disturb things. So this is stable. And he said it was quantum mechanically stable as well, if this loop were small enough. So um, um, he commented that these two were quite complementary. It brings forward the idea that maybe if you looked at the final um, quantum theory of gravity, these two models actually might look the same because time and space get confused when you get into the, into the uh, early days here. But, but ours has uh, space-time here, and um, every event has events that preceded it that we would say were causing that things to occur there. So it's sort of like this. I'm sitting on this chair. Um, if you came along and sat on my knees, what's holding you up? Well, my knees. Someone else could sit on your knees. There'd be a line of people. But it's all held up by the chair. And this is the usual case. You've got a boundary condition at the beginning of the universe. But suppose you sat on my knees and then people sat around in a circle. And then we remove the chair. And then the person, I'm sitting on someone else's knees. We're all sitting on someone else's knees. So this is what the closed time-like loop is like. Um, you get uh, the normal causality locally that we're used to seeing. And local effects are important. Uh, general relativity has local energy conservation. It doesn't have global energy conservation. Ours is a finite past but it has no earliest event. A universe with causes, but no first cause, may seem counterintuitive. But our intuitions are based on our experience of time. What general relativity tells us is that time can behave in ways that are very different from our experience, especially when space-time curvature becomes significantly large. Scott and Lee have shown that this may be the key to explaining the mystery of our cosmic origins.